Becca, thank you for being here today. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. Absolutely. Us. Um, would you tell us a little bit about your background with um, sexual addiction and as a professional, your training? Sure. Yeah. So um, I own and direct the Trauma and Addiction Recovery Center, okay. um, which um, specializes in trauma and addiction, but particularly sex addiction. Okay. And um, so I have had a passion for sex addiction and just recovery in general, addiction mm -hmm. recovery and trauma recovery mm -hmm. uh, for a long time. Um, I've been in the field since, um, I would say, 2003. Okay. Um, started as a tech in a treatment center. Okay. Um, and then I went to graduate school. I went to Vanderbilt and got my counseling degree and um, became a therapist at awesome. that same treatment center. Okay. And then um, that's treatment center world, residential treatment center world has mm -hmm. kind of been my background okay. uh, largely up until about three years ago. Okay. Um, and just, I think my interest in addiction and sexual addiction mm -hmm. came a lot just from professional training mm -hmm. and influences I had, and also just my personal world of um, kind of my own healing process mm -hmm. and being on my own journey. And so kind of putting all that together and then... Um, uh, realizing I really have a passion for this and I really want to offer ways for people to be able to recover from something that is incredibly devastating. Yeah. Um, and it can just be so easy to feel lost in it. Absolutely. Um, but I know that there are solutions. And so I wanted to be able to offer that. Um, so um, I uh, pursued my certified sex addiction therapist okay. uh, certification. Mm -hmm. And um, I've been a CSAT for a couple of years now and just kind of continue growing and learning about th about this work. Okay, awesome. Yeah. So, Becca, I w if you would, um, I want to hear from you because I think some people wonder if sexual addiction is actually a real thing. I know mm -hmm. there's a lot of controversy over it. Yeah. So I guess I want to ask you, like, do you think that sexual addiction is real? Mm -hmm. And if so... What differentiates that between uh, just having a high sex drive or just really enjoying sex? Yeah, that's a really good question. And I know there's a lot of um, different information out there mm -hmm. and sources of information. Um, so maybe I'll kind of come through the back door and talk about the high sex drive. Sure. The difference yeah. between that and sex addiction first. So um, when, when I'm talking about sex addiction, people in my field talk about sex addiction, mm -hmm. we mean something really specific. Mm -hmm. Um, we mean that the, the person who's struggling with that is experiencing certain, um, consequences and certain, um, dynamics mm -hmm. that somebody with a high sex drive doesn't mm -hmm. experience. Okay. So somebody with a high sex drive, uh, they really like sex. Mm -hmm. They like to have a lot of sex. Mm -hmm. They maybe have more sex than maybe another person would. Mm -hmm. But the difference is that a sex addict is um, pursuing sex mm -hmm. in a way that is hurting them. Okay. It's in a way that's creating consequences for them, mm -hmm. and it's it's in a way that they can't stop. Okay. Even when they want to. So they're, they're out of control. To stop. It's just kind of out of out of control. Mm -hmm. um, and, and also what we know is that um, people who struggle with sex addiction tend to be more likely to have other mental health issues going okay. on, whereas so, a high sex drive is not necessarily going to be associated with that. Uh -huh. um, they tend, oddly enough, to have some pretty conventional sexual beliefs and norms. Interesting. So they might okay. believe mm -hmm. certain things about sex mm -hmm. that they think is wrong mm -hmm. or that's not in their value system, mm -hmm. but they're doing it anyway. And that's not true with somebody with a high sex drive. Got it. So um, there's a lot going on with somebody with a sex addiction that somebody with a high sex drive, that's just not what they're experiencing. Okay. There is a kind of a camp that says sex addiction is not a thing, mm -hmm. that's not real, mm -hmm. and um, the mental health community has kind of not helped with that in some ways just right. because there's been such a reluctance to see sex addiction mm -hmm. as a problem. Mm -hmm. um, there's also a lot of people who think, well, that's just an excuse. Mm -hmm. It's just a cop-out mm -hmm. that gives people permission to mm -hmm. act however they want. Mm -hmm. um, but the research just doesn't bear that out. Mm -hmm. There's um, just lots and lots of evidence that people who struggle with compulsive sexual behavior mm -hmm. have a problem mm -hmm. and they don't want to be doing mm -hmm. what they're doing and mm -hmm. they're having a hard time stopping. Okay. And so, um, I don't, I'm not sure if that answers your yeah, question. That's but, yeah, that's great. Yeah. So, w Becca, in your experience, are there different levels of sexual addiction? Mm -hmm. And if so, can you kind of speak a little bit about the different signs and symptoms of those levels of addiction? Sure. Yeah, well, so uh, um, just kind of talking about sex addiction, um, how do you know if a sex addiction is even present? Mm -hmm. And um, So I, 
you know, I don't want to get too lost in the weeds here, sure. but there's, it's really interesting to me. It's hard to know yeah. sometimes how interested other people are, but, um, mm -hmm. You know, for a long time, um, we didn't have anything that talked about sex addiction as a diagnosis, mm -hmm. uh, an official diagnosis. Mm -hmm. And like um, the book that we use to diagnose people as mental health professionals, mm -hmm. the Diagnostic and Statistical mm -hmm. Manual, mm -hmm. it's, it's still not in there, actually. Right, right. Um, and then there's another book called The International Classification of Diseases mm -hmm. that the World Health Organization mm -hmm. publishes regularly. They update it regularly. Right. Every disease known to us right. is in that book. Right. In 2019, the World Health Organization chose to include a diagnosis that they're calling compulsive sexual behavior disorder. Okay. And that's important for a lot of reasons. First yeah. of all, so everybody has the same criteria. Right. So if we want to do research on this, we know exactly what we're looking for. It's mm -hmm. right there. Mm -hmm. um, but it also kind of just legitimates this is an issue. And Absolutely. insurance companies can start considering paying for treatment, mm -hmm. things like that. Mm -hmm. In that diagnosis, there's three main categories of symptoms that we're really looking for with sex addiction. Okay. One of them is loss of control, which you mm -hmm. kind of alluded mm -hmm. to a minute mm -hmm. ago. It's, I don't want to be doing this and I can't stop. Yep. I keep doing it anyway. Yep. That's loss of control. Okay. The second one is I keep doing it even though I know it's hurting me mm -hmm. or it could hurt me. Mm -hmm. Like, um, you know, not to get too graphic, but for sure. example, if I masturbate while I'm driving in the car, right. I can't stop myself from doing it. Right. I know, or at least should know, this yep. really is risky. I could get in a wreck, hurt That's myself, right. hurt somebody else, but I do it anyway. Right. And then the third one is the preoccupation or obsession. Mm -hmm. So this is something that takes up a lot of space in my brain mm -hmm. or takes up a lot of space in my time. Mm -hmm. Either I'm preparing to have an affair or I'm having an affair or mm -hmm. I'm hiding mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. stuff that's happening mm -hmm. because of the affair and trying to keep the secret. It's just taking up a lot of space in my life. Yeah. Um, so really we're looking for those three criteria okay. for us to say this is a sex addiction. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so yeah. Becca, tell, tell me a little bit more please about the levels of sexual addiction. Because yeah. I know some people are seeking anonymous sex with prostitutes and some people are addicted to pornography but not necessarily physically acting out. So right. I'd love if you could speak to that a little bit. Yeah, so um, yeah, for sure there's different levels and kind of anywhere from mild to like extremely mm -hmm. severe. One of the things that's not a level of sex addiction is um, sexual behavior that I don't agree with. For okay. example, if I have a partner or I have a loved one or somebody mm -hmm. I know who's doing something sexual and I don't like it, mm -hmm. that's not sex addiction. Okay. Or if somebody's a member of, uh, for example, a church community mm -hmm. who maybe has some values around sexuality mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. you know, that they hold to right. and this person's acting in a way that's contrary to that, that doesn't make it a sex addiction. Right. It may be in that in that form of faith, it may be a sin, uh -huh. or it may be I don't like that, mm -hmm. or I disagree mm -hmm. with that, but it doesn't make it a sex addiction. So that's really important to know. Sure. Okay. But then it can be anywhere from uh, level one, sex addiction is typically thought of like um, not behaviors that are not illegal. Uh -huh. So like masturbation, pornography use, um, affairs, uh -huh. um, behaviors like that. That's okay. kind of a level, one, it's considered level one. Now I wouldn't necessarily say that's mild, Right. Um, right. But it's it doesn't reach the level of like legal consequences. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, level two is when it starts getting more into legal issues. Mm -hmm. So prostitution, for mm -hmm. example, mm -hmm. um, voyeurism, exhibitionism, mm -hmm. um, fraudism. Mm -hmm. You start kind of having maybe some victims that mm -hmm. are in that, people mm -hmm. maybe being exploited. Okay. Um, so it gets a, l a little bit more serious, especially on a legal level. Right. Level three is um, where exploitation is happening, abuse is happening, um, extreme boundary violations are mm -hmm. happening. So mm -hmm. that looks like rape, um, looks like um, child exploitation, right. molestation, um, boundary violations, like, mm -hmm. for example, between a supervisor and, a, and a, an employee sure. or a clergy member and a church member. Okay. Um, people who are in positions of authority mm -hmm. and power taking mm -hmm. advantage of somebody who's supposed to be under them. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of level three. Mm -hmm. And really that you're starting to talk about. Uh, offending behavior, sexual offending mm -hmm, behavior, mm -hmm. and um, not everybody who sexually offends is a sex addict. Mm -hmm. So some people might rape or mm -hmm. uh, molest children. Mm -hmm. They're not necessarily a sex addict. Okay. And there are people who offend who are also sex addicts. Like right. th those two things are right. going together. Okay. So that's a good differentiation. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I would. And also, I will say, yeah. not most sex addicts don't offend. So that's really important to know too, because okay. when people hear the word sex addict, yeah. they kind of immediately have some fear. Um, most people who struggle with sex addiction are not s sexual offenders. Okay. They don't exploit, they mm -hmm. don't abuse, they don't do okay. those things, so. Okay. Um, tell me a little bit about potential causes or what sets somebody up to kind of fall into sexual addiction or to 
struggle yeah. with sexual addiction. Sure. Yeah, and so we don't know uh, for sure what causes sex addiction. Mm -hmm. We know there's some high correlations between um, sex addiction and adulthood and, for example, childhood trauma. Mm -hmm. um, there's quite a bit of research about um, sex addicts tend to come from households where uh, the family tends to be disengaged, maybe not mm -hmm. a lot of closeness or connection. Mm -hmm. um, the family also may tend to have some pretty rigid rules, uh -huh. especially around sexuality. Okay. Um, but just in general, kind of rigid, um, this is the only way mm -hmm. that it's okay to be human in mm -hmm. the world. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes that can come from a religious background mm -hmm. where there's some, what I would call religiosity. Absolutely. Um, which really often carries a lot of shame around sex, yes. and so that can be a huge influence. Yeah. Um, but other types of rigidity, like, uh, for example, having a parent who was in the military, and mm -hmm. maybe they don't can't separate mm -hmm. family life mm -hmm. from military life, mm -hmm. and so there's a lot of stru stru structure. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's a couple things. But also just um, boundary issues in the family mm -hmm. system, where there's mm -hmm. maybe the child has become... Uh, parentalized mm -hmm. or even a surrogate spouse mm -hmm. type of mm -hmm. uh, situation happening. So there's some enmeshment, right. not good boundaries in the family system. Um, early exposure yep. to um, whether it's through sexual abuse mm -hmm. or you probably know like early just, exposure to pornography. Oh my goodness. It's yeah. so, I can actually, mm -hmm. I can actually tell by the age of a client mm -hmm. probably how they first got exposed to pornography. Really? Yeah. If they're 40 and above, oh, probably sure. they found pornography. I don't know why, but it's pretty common for yeah. people to say, I found a stack of Playboys in the woods. Right. I don't know if the it was woods the is era like a of great media. place. Yeah. Different media eras. Stuff like that. Or right. I found my dad's pornography stash or my brother, my right. older brothers. Right. Um, but if they're 40 and younger, mm -hmm. then they probably got exposed through the internet. Okay. And that's happening uh, way more often. So, and the earlier right. someone's exposed, just the more likely it is to kind of get uh, fused with their developing sexuality right. and if there's other dynamics happening in the family and suddenly yep. I have this way that mm -hmm. I can feel better mm -hmm. and I can get my needs met, mm -hmm. supposedly. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of different contributions that mm -hmm. correlate with sex addiction. Mm -hmm. Of course, there's no one of those is like causing sex addiction. Right. And of course, genetics are a part of that too and your mm -hmm. predisposition to be addicted in the first place. Like So all of that's a part of it. But yeah. So lots of different variables. Yeah. Yeah. Lots of variables. Okay. Um, as far as men versus women, what kind of numbers are you seeing or are you finding in the research as far yeah. as who's, you know, are men struggling more? Are women struggling more? So, uh, you know, I don't know exact numbers on this. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's estimated that maybe three to six percent of the U.S. population is addicted okay. um, to sex. Um, of course, we usually think of men more often mm -hmm, as mm -hmm. far as your kind of traditional conception of sex mm -hmm, addiction. Mm -hmm. um, usually when we think of women who are struggling, it's more about the romance kind of love addiction mm -hmm, type of mm -hmm. um, fantasy around the relationship. Um, whereas men may more often, it's like sex. I, I don't could care less about the relationship. I want the sex. Right. And there's everything in between that. Right. Um, with internet pornography, though, mm -hmm. some of that stuff is starting to change. Mm -hmm. um, women are looking at porn more and more mm -hmm. on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. um, and again, just if that's being introduced and that exposure, mm -hmm. there's more likely to be an addiction. Just like we see chemical addiction fluctuating yes. where there's certain chemical, uh, certain drugs are available mm -hmm. in the mm -hmm. market. And mm -hmm. so we see that addiction right. skyrocket. Yep. Um, it's, it's very similar okay. with pornography. Okay. Um. Becca, is there a difference between porn addiction and sex addiction? And if so, what would you say the differences are? Um, I would say yes, there's a, a difference, and mm -hmm. no, there's not a difference. Okay. <laughs> um, I, I mean, I do actually think that there are some significant differences between somebody who primarily um, watches porn, mm -hmm. and that's a compulsive behavior for mm -hmm. them, mm -hmm. versus somebody who primarily has affairs, and uh -huh. that's a compulsive behavior for them. Okay. Just even in the nature of that, having affairs mm -hmm. takes a really different kind of personality than somebody who kind of maybe keeps it all Interesting. Um, in fantasy, okay. keeps it all kind of, uh, nobody knows about it, don't involve other live humans, okay. you know, I just okay. like the fantasy aspect okay. of this. Okay. Um, you can kind of see more, um, some people would say that you can kind of see more personality disorders involved in somebody who's having sex uh, with live people okay. versus um, pornography might be more introverted, might be more depressed, might be more kind of shut off, isolated. Avoid an attachment kind of. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And 
And also, I, I would say that there's just the spectrum. So it's right. hard to pigeonhole. Right. Um, I work with plenty of people who mm -hmm. do both. Mm -hmm. They have affairs or they're mm -hmm. having sex mm -hmm. with other people. Mm -hmm. And their pornography is a big factor in their life. Mm -hmm. And I think even I read something the other day that was saying 90% of um, uh, sex addicts, mm -hmm. porn is an issue sure. in their acting out. Sure. So even if somebody's primary way of acting out is mm -hmm. having affairs mm -hmm. or finding sex partners, porn is probably still a part of the picture. Okay. So it's really hard to just say, yes, you're a porn addict, right. you're a sex addict. Right. There's just so much overlap. Right. That, but there are different needs that right. are being met through this. Right. There are different kind of motivations and different yeah. um, aspects that are happening with yeah. each. Yeah, and when I work with couples, it's pretty common for somebody to come in and say, my husband or my wife is a sex addict, and then we get into kind of teasing out what's going on, signs and symptoms, mm -hmm. and then I find out that, well, it's really pornography that they're yeah. using, and yes. it's become problematic. It's not necessarily that they're physically acting out. Yeah. So I feel I think it's important to delineate between the two for some because like you alluded to earlier somebody just because they find somebody's behaviors problematic doesn't mean that they are in fact that's in right. addiction for, yeah, yeah i mean i think that's just so important mm -hmm. even i can be the partner of somebody mm -hmm. who's had an affair mm -hmm. or is looking at pornography and uh -huh. it can be devastating to me absolutely tra incredibly traumatic absolutely and yet that doesn't mean the person is a sex addict that's right they did something that's really painful yeah but it Really, those three criteria we talked about earlier, mm -hmm. loss of control, mm -hmm. continued behavior despite mm -hmm. negative consequences, uh -huh. and preoccupation mm -hmm. or obsession, mm -hmm. those really have to be present. Yeah. Um, even if I really hate the behavior that's being that's happening. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that that's exactly right. And um, it's really interesting to work with partners where the the person's, act, the addict's acting out behavior is pornography mm -hmm. um, versus, you know, having mm -hmm. affairs or prostitution mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. some other live um, acting out, mm -hmm. um, it can, can be just as devastating. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It feels like betrayal. Yes, it feels like, and it's like, I will never look like that woman in That's that right. video. Or And, of course, it can go the other way, too, and yes. there's what, females who are sex addicks, too. We That's generally right. talk about men, but yeah. that just constant having to compare myself to who you're sexually attracted to. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Becca, can you speak a little bit more about the betrayed partners experience? Because I get that a lot from partners that are feeling super wounded. Yes. You know, where do I go to process this? Yes. And is there hope for my partner to get better? And can you kind of normalize what somebody who's been, felt betrayed or been betrayed, yeah. what their experience might be? Yeah. You know, and we're learning a lot more about this too. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. Um, I think the more we understand about attachment, mm -hmm. the more we can understand about mm -hmm. how devastating it can mm -hmm. be for a partner mm -hmm. to experience their mm -hmm. husband or mm -hmm. whatever, their mm -hmm. significant other mm -hmm. acting out. Mm -hmm. um, because when we get into that partnership relationship, mm -hmm. our biology changes. I That's mean, right. our attachment to that person literally changes yeah. our biology and yes. theirs too. Yes. And we that's our person. Yeah. We should be able to feel safe with them. No that's matter right. how hard my day is, I know I'm going to go home mm -hmm. and there's this mm -hmm. person mm -hmm. who I know has my back. Mm -hmm. And then to find out he's been having sex with someone else mm -hmm. or he's been looking at pornography. Mm -hmm. um, it it literally, the partner's reaction is literally a traumatic reaction. Right. They literally are experiencing trauma. Yes. In the field, we call it betrayal trauma. Yeah. Um, so they're literally having the same reactions as someone, for example, who uh, was in a war and had a you know, devastating experience or someone yeah. who was physically abused. They're having a traumatic reaction inside Aww. themselves. So they yeah. can have panic attacks. Yeah. Um, they can rage. That's pretty common Absolutely. for partners. Yes. Um, they can have this hypervigilance of mm -hmm. like, I don't know what to trust, so I need to constantly be on the lookout for where the next danger is coming from. Yes. So that uh, lots of partners struggle with like snooping. They want to look through. Oh, playing detective. Absolutely. Yes, yeah. playing detective yeah. um, because they just want to stay safe. They want right. to be able to see the next hit coming that's so right. that they don't have to Aww. be blindsided by it. Yeah. Um, they start having negative beliefs about themselves. Mm -hmm. Why am I not enough? Mm -hmm. Why can't mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not beautiful enough? I'm mm -hmm. not attractive enough. Mm -hmm. He wouldn't be acting out mm -hmm. if he really loved me and mm -hmm. I was enough. Mm -hmm. um, so th it can just really devastate mm -hmm. that person. And even mm -hmm. what can be real common is the sex addict gets into recovery, uh -huh. starts feeling some relief. Uh -huh. like, oh, okay, there's hope. I don't mm -hmm. have to do this anymore. Mm -hmm. All my secrets are out there. Yeah. I'm not looking over my shoulder. Yeah. And so they're starting to feel hopeful and the partner has just been blindsided by this That's right. hugely awful stuff. So they can start to actually 
spiral. Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, decompensate mm-hmm. even when mm-hmm. they've been super functional their right. whole life. They've right. never had those problems, but yes. now they can't get out of bed, things yeah. like that. So it can be really painful. Okay. Well, let's on on the heels of that. Tell me a little bit about treatment then, and how how do if somebody's struggling with sex addiction and or porn addiction, what does treatment typically include? How long does it take? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So um, um, the process of um, getting help and treatment for sex addiction generally takes two to five years. Mm-hmm. So this is not it's not a short term quick mm-hmm. fix mm-hmm. kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, I, what I'm kind of hesitating here because what I want to be clear about is we don't know a cure for sex addiction. Mm-hmm. We don't have that. Mm-hmm. It, and for any addiction, mm-hmm. frankly. Mm-hmm. Um, if somebody's struggling with addiction, mm-hmm. it's probably going to be a factor in their lives for the mm-hmm. rest of their lives. Mm-hmm. And so what we talk about, like at the Trauma and Addiction Recovery Center, mm-hmm. we talk about this is a lifestyle change. Right. This is like if you were diagnosed with diabetes uh-huh. or another chronic illness, uh-huh. you are going to have to change your life yep. to be able to accommodate this disorder Mm -hmm. and make sure you can stay in recovery Mm -hmm. in remission Mm -hmm. um and that requires probably for the rest of your life just having having a different way of living and so um what that usually looks like especially right at the beginning is um a sex addict or or their partner may come in Mm -hmm. we want to do a lot of assessment Uh and evaluation we want to just kind of really get a hold of what's going on Mm -hmm. um and then we're probably going to recommend some kind of support system that's not that's outside of therapy Mm -hmm. or maybe what i should say is in addition to therapy right and that might look like a 12-step program Mm -hmm. like sex addicts anonymous Mm -hmm. for example or Mm -hmm. sexaholics anonymous Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, there's also some, um, I think, Celebrate Recovery, which mm-hmm. is a Christian-based mm-hmm. support program, mm-hmm. is starting to get some really good kind of traction oh, with good. sex addiction support, Good, um, especially in our area in Chattanooga. Excellent. Um, so something, though, where you can have constant support for mm-hmm. yourself mm-hmm. on a daily basis mm-hmm. that doesn't require you going to a therapist's office or waiting right. a week or two weeks right. to get into a therapist. Um, then, uh, obviously, we're going to recommend therapy mm-hmm. as well, mm-hmm. because while the support is to help you stay sober sexually, Mm -hmm. you're going to need some help to look at what's contributing to this. That's right. What has been contributing to the acting out behaviors. Mm -hmm. And so therapy helps with that. And um, we want to really help the sex addict Mm -hmm. look at his behavior Mm -hmm. or her behavior Mm -hmm. um, and get a handle on what's going on. Mm -hmm. What are my triggers? Mm -hmm. What what needs and longings Mm -hmm. and hopes Mm -hmm. haven't been met that Mm -hmm. I'm trying to get met here? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then how do I get them met in a healthy way? Um, So we're going to look at all that. Sometimes a person isn't able to uh, get stable Mm -hmm. with that level of Mm -hmm. support. And if Mm -hmm. that's true, then we're going to offer something more. Mm -hmm. Um, It could be like an intensive Mm -hmm. outpatient program. We offer an intensive outpatient program Mm -hmm. that's uh, several hours a week okay. uh, for a period of time, for seven okay. weeks. Okay. Um, and it's just meant to kind of like, let's drop you into this thing and yes. get your feet grounded. Um, and that can be really helpful. Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes that's still not enough and the, they can't stabilize. Mm-hmm. So then we would recommend a residential treatment program okay. where that you literally kind of get picked up out of your life mm-hmm. and go over here. Mm-hmm. and Like a kinda, total shock to their system. Exactly. Just, just shut everything else yeah. out, focus yep. on this for a period of time, yep. and get the help you need before okay. you start to reintegrate back into your life. Yep. So those are kind of the levels okay. that can happen with okay. treatment. Um, for the partners, it's also really important mm-hmm. that they're getting help and support. Absolutely. Um, so those same levels of treatment are available mm-hmm. for them. Um, oh, good. Um, but yeah, we would, mm-hmm. again, we would just start mm-hmm. with wanting to mm-hmm. kind of assess and mm-hmm. evaluate what's mm-hmm. going on. Mm-hmm. We want to address the trauma mm-hmm. right away mm-hmm. because that level of activation, yes. it's just hard to sustain yes. that over a long period of time. So yeah. we want to help them kind of get some emotion regulation yes. skills, um, kind of down regulate mm-hmm. all that mm-hmm. traumatic reaction mm-hmm. and then start looking at, okay, how can I be in a healthy relationship? Mm-hmm. Oftentimes, not always with partners. There's also a history, a childhood history mm-hmm. that's contributing to this. Yes. Not contributing to the sex addiction. That's not the partner's responsibility mm-hmm. in any way, mm-hmm. but contributing to her part of the relationship. Mm-hmm. And so to help her start looking at that, mm-hmm. if that's something that needs to be mm-hmm. looked at okay. um, and just help her get stable. Yeah. Sometimes even partner's recovery can even be delayed just because, like I said, it just is so blindsiding. Absolutely. It's so, such a shock to the system. Yes. And there may be, there's maybe a lot of issues to, mm-hmm. um, do I want to stay in this marriage? Mm-hmm. Do I want to leave? Mm-hmm. What about the children? Mm-hmm. Is there concerns around that? Is, yep. What about finances? You know, so there can be, it can be really complicated. Yes. So. 
Um, yeah, when I work with couples in a fair recovery, we usually tell yes. them it takes at least three years if you're deliberately working around That's this. That's exactly right. But you have yes. to de be deliberate because That's if exactly you delay right. it and try and deny it or suppress yes. it or ignore it or just forget it ever happened, yes. it usually kind of becomes cancerous and ends up. Yeah, that's so Being true. Being corrosive for the relationship. So. Yeah, sometimes I say as long, it's going to take as long as both of you are procrastinating, you know, like yes. jump in. That's what's going to give you yes. the best chance at getting stable sooner. That's awesome. Uh, yes. Yeah. So with that, do you do you believe that there's hope for people that are struggling with sex and porn addiction? Can oh they, my goodness. Can they get healthy? Can they be sober? Yeah. Yes. Uh, you know, I wouldn't even be doing this work if I didn't believe that. So, okay. yeah, I... 100%. While I don't think I don't know of a cure mm -hmm. for sex addiction, mm -hmm. there is absolutely recovery mm -hmm. is possible. Mm -hmm. um, it is a treatable disorder, mm -hmm. and not only that, a lot of sex addicts who pursue recovery mm -hmm. actually find that life is more fulfilling, mm -hmm. more meaningful. Mm -hmm. That they're able to do things that they couldn't do before just mm -hmm. because they. They hadn't done the work. Mm -hmm. They didn't even know there was work to do. Right. You know, yep. they hadn't done the work to clear out the stuff that was keeping them blocked yep. um, so that they can actually live their life in an authentic, congruent way. So mm -hmm. often um, sex addicts are living at war with themselves. Right. You know, they're yep. and partners are, too. I mean, yes. that's both. They're they're, yeah. they are, they're what their authentic self wants mm -hmm. and needs mm -hmm. and believes mm -hmm. is so at odds with mm -hmm their actual behavior mm -hmm. and how they're living their lives. Mm -hmm. And to be in recovery means not just stop acting mm -hmm. out mm -hmm. or, you know, stop mm -hmm. uh, your trauma reaction. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. it, it doesn't mean just that. Mm -hmm. It means how do I actually live in a way that's congruent with who I am? Mm -hmm. How do I have an authentic self that mm -hmm. gets to live in the world instead of hiding and people pleasing and yes. um, acting out all of that, there's, trying to get love? Yeah, there's so much freedom from just being so honest and forthright. So much. And, Freedom. Not have anything else to hide anymore. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. That the sex addiction and for both the mm -hmm. partners mm -hmm. and the sex addict, the sex addiction seems like that's the problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But what we know is there's so much. It's, it's like the symptom. tip of the iceberg. It's, a, it's the symptom of right, the a problem. bigger issue. And yeah. so if we can address the problem, yeah, man, life can get really, really good. Amen. Really good. Amen. Yeah. So where do people go? What kind of resources are you? Do you offer, Becca? And then what are yeah. what else are you aware of in terms of nationwide where sure. people can turn to? Yeah. So with the Trauma and Addiction Recovery Center, we offer uh, several. Uh, levels of care. Mm -hmm. um, so anywhere from individual therapy, couple therapy. Mm -hmm. um, and then we also offer several groups uh, for partners and for sex addicts. Excellent. Um, and then we also offer the intensive outpatient program for sex addicts, m uh, male sex addicts, okay. um, which is Saturday based. Okay. So that actually makes it something that can be doable for someone who has maybe they work Monday through Friday. Mm -hmm. um, they can come in on Saturday. Mm -hmm. It's six mm -hmm. hours, mm -hmm. seven week program. Mm -hmm. So it's not the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. uh, for seven weeks, come and do this intensive program. Mm -hmm. um, get your feet on the ground, mm -hmm. grounded in recovery. Mm -hmm. And then we also offer a sister program for partners okay. of sex addicts. Okay. Um, that's less intense. It's mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, two hours mm -hmm. every week for mm -hmm. seven weeks. And we offer individual therapy as a part of that mm -hmm. and couples therapy mm -hmm. as a part of that. Mm -hmm. So it's a whole package. Um, Couples don't have to do that together. They right. can, and it can right. be super, super powerful right. uh, for the addict to come in and the mm -hmm. partner to come mm -hmm. in. Mm -hmm. But it maybe one's ready for help and the other one's not, mm -hmm. and that's okay. Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. just come in and get the help. Um, so that's what we offer, and we do some workshops and things mm -hmm. like that as well. Mm -hmm. But those, that's kind of the basics of what we offer okay. at the Trauma and Addiction Recovery Center. Okay. Um, there's a, a website called sexhelp.com, okay. a gentleman named Rob Weiss, okay. who has just really contributed so much okay. to this field. Awesome. Um, okay. And he has a lot of free resources okay. on his website. There's also a website called um, bloomforwomen.com, I okay. believe is the address. And um, they also offer a lot of free resources okay. for partners okay. of sex addicts. And so those are two resources that just come okay. off the top of my head. Okay. Um, I know um, Bethesda Workshop. Yes. With Marnie Faree. That's right. Yes. She's in Nashville. That's right. Um, and they offer um, uh, like a week-long intensive, okay. both for partners okay. and for sex addicts. Okay. And I think they have one for couples as okay. well, but don't quote me on that. Okay. Um, and that that's really great. I've um, worked with many clients who've gone through that, okay. and it really just jump-starts their, their recovery. That's excellent. So, yeah. um, and then Faithful and True, Dr. Mark Laser. I know I've yes, had some clients. Right. He's yes. up in Minneapolis, I think, Yeah. in yeah. Minnesota. Do you know much about Pat Carnes and his – does he have a – a recovery center? Um, he's, I believe he's affiliated with the Meadows, which is okay. in Arizona, okay. which is a residential treatment center. Okay. And they're, they have an excellent program okay. uh, for sex addicts. Okay. Also, Pine Grove in um, 
Arkansas? Mississippi. Okay. Uh, down south. Okay. Okay. <laughs> uh, Pine Grove is has an excellent program as okay. well, and okay. um, especially Pine Grove is great for. Um, any sex addict, mm -hmm. but particularly those who struggle with co-occurring issues. So what, if there's also maybe a chemical dependency happening sure. and or a mental health concern happening. So like a, like um, a anxiety depression or right. bipolar yes. or a cocaine addiction or gambling. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So they, they really have a lot of resources to be able to just, let's just address all oh, of Oh, excellent. So, yeah. Okay. And then the ranch, anything about the ranch is um, the ranch is outside of Nashville, okay. and um, they have a program there that's for sex addiction. Okay. Um, and um, they've got had some changes lately. I think they do still also treat trauma. Okay. So. Okay. So there are resources available if There's people want help. Lots there. of resources. And okay. What I would say is just don't get overwhelmed by all that. Mm -hmm. Come talk to us. Mm -hmm. We would love to meet with anybody mm -hmm. who's struggling. Mm -hmm. um, we will sit down with you, mm -hmm. talk it through. Mm -hmm. Even just we uh, offer a free consultation. Oh, Come awesome. in, talk to us. We'll point you in the right direction. If we're mm -hmm. not it, we'll get you somewhere where um, you can get the help you need. But yeah, we, we want people to come in and get the help. There's a lot out there on the internet and it's great. It's a great resource. Yeah. And also don't get overwhelmed by it. Yes. Just come in, yes. let someone help you kind of figure it out and figure out what next steps are.